It's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to the fall 2012 presidential lecture. This event is the fifth lecture in our series and we have been honored to host some of the finest scholars and creative minds in the world. As many uh, here know, this series is part of a broader effort at our university to provide a forum where timely and important issues can be discussed in an atmosphere of civility and mutual respect. UVU prides itself on being an inclusive institution wherein a diversity of ideas and perspectives are welcomed and valued through interaction with influential scholars, policymakers, and other key leaders on the national global stage, our campus community, and most especially our students, become better prepared to meet the challenges and opportunities of a complex world. Toward this end, we couldn't be more pleased to welcome to our campus one of the most dynamic and penetrating of public voices, Sir Ken Robinson. As an internationally recognized leader in the development of education, creativity, and innovation, Sir Ken is one of the world's leading speakers. An estimated 200 million people in more than 150 countries have seen videos of his 2006 and 2000 TED Talks at the popular TED Conference. Active in government, international agencies, and cultural organizations, Robinson works, works to promote change to education, enterprise, and culture by unlocking creativity. Sir Ken, I was very pleased to hear your quote from Abraham Lincoln in your TED Talk and also read it in your book. As someone with keen interests in Lincoln, I couldn't think of a more fitting quote for the spirit you bring to the test we face as educators. In 1862, at, during a second an annual message to Congress, Lincoln said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. And so it is for the students in the 21st century. We must think anew and act anew if we are to educate ourselves to meet the challenges of our times. Born in Liverpool, Sir Ken Robinson started as a professor of education at the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. His book, The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything, is a New York Times bestseller and was translated into 21 languages. From 1985 to 1989, he was director of the Arts in Schools Project, a major UK initiative to improve teaching of the arts and in 1998 was appointed by the British government to chair the National Advisory Committee on Creative and Cultural Education, the largest ever inquiry into the importance of creativity in education and the economy. Until 2001, he was professor of education at Warwick University in the UK and is now professor emeritus. He has served as an advisor to a variety of high profile public and private organizations, including the governments of Hong Kong and Singapore, the European Commission, and Paul McCartney's Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts. Among other roles, he is currently senior advisor to the J. Paul Getty Trust in Los Angeles. In 2003, Elizabeth II knighted him for his services to the arts. And as those of you who attended the presidential lecture reception can tell you, yesterday evening I knighted his son James, <laughs> whom we are delighted to have here this morning as well. Sir Ken's latest work is uh, his book, the 10th anniversary edition of his classic book entitled Out of Our Minds, Learning to Be Creative. We are delighted to have him here to speak about that book. And I'm happy to report, Sir Ken, that your book has generated rich and lively discussion among our students and faculty. We've distributed dozens and dozens of copies across campus, and I can say with enthusiasm that this was much more of an investment than an expense. Thank you for making this discussion possible and for your presence here today. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of Sir Ken's remarks this morning is Creativity is as important as literacy. Please join me in welcoming Sir Ken to the stage.
Well, thank you, Professor Holland. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know, it's early for me. <laughs> Whose idea was this? <laughs> 10 o'clock in the morning? I don't think so. Um, well, thank you for coming. Um, and um, thank you for, to Professor Holland, uh, President Holland, for that introduction. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I say that because you have to. <laughs> what am I going to say? I really wish I was not here in Provo today. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing's been a dreadful mistake. Um, <laughs> no, I really am pleased to be here. Um, I was in Oslo recently. Has anybody here been to Oslo? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, beautiful place. Uh, I went there and uh, took... The plane was five hours late. Uh, so I got there late, a bit harassed, and then um, I was introduced, I, I kind of went straight from the plane, you know, to the stage. And as I was going on the stage, uh, the person introducing me said, have you been to Oslo before? I said, no, never have. Um, I felt confident in saying that. Um, and then afterwards, we went out for dinner, uh, me and this woman. Uh, it's a long story. <laughs> But, uh, and then she said, uh, over dinner, I realised I had been to Oslo before. For a week. <laughs> this worried me because I live in Los Angeles. I mean, if you live in LA, you don't kind of wander casually into Oslo. <laughs> by mistake. You know, thinking, uh, I thought it was San Diego. <laughs> it's an effort, you know, it took ten days of my life and I'd completely forgotten about it. Now, I tell you this, um, because I was about to say it's my first time here at UVU. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Have I been here before? How was it? Do you remember? Was it? <laughs> I don't think we need this for a moment, do we? There we go. Um, no, but the real reason I tell you is that for any generation prior to mine, I mean, it could just be I'm cracking up, and that's perfectly possible, uh, but uh, for any generation generation prior to mine, uh, taking any kind of trip was a kind of life-changing experience. My, my, my father was born in 1914. Uh, my mother was born in 1918. Uh, sorry, 1919. Do you care when my mother was born? <laughs> I can check the date if you like. 1919. And they didn't really go anywhere. And their parents certainly never went anywhere. Uh, and I travel now all the time. My kids, I think, have been to uh, more countries than any previous generation of my family even contemplated going to. Now, I tell you it partly because, uh, to illustrate this point, that uh, there are, and it's embedded in, in Lincoln's quote, that there are things happening on the planet now for which there is no precedent in human history. We all of us face challenges that no other generation on the planet has ever had to contemplate. Um, and I mean that quite literally, uh, that, you know, I don't mean it metaphorically, that there is a revolution happening, uh, and the character of it has massive implications for education. Mostly, in my experience, education is struggling uh, to come to terms with the 20th century. And uh, the problem, of course, is that we're not in that one anymore either. I'll give you an example. When I went to college, I did go to college, by the way, uh, when I went, uh, it was in 1968, and um, I was there for four years, and at the end of it, I got my degree, uh, I think, and it was the 60s, you know, I don't know, <laughs> come on, maybe I got it, I don't know. No, I got it, and I knew that my degree guaranteed me a job. There was no question about that. If I wanted a job, I'd just pop out and get one. Uh, because I had a degree. A degree was an absolute passport to employment. Um, you know, when, I was, when I left college, the idea you'd be out of work with a college degree was completely ridiculous. The only reason you wouldn't have a job with a degree was if you didn't want a job. And I didn't want a job, really, <laughs> honestly. Uh, I was... Uh, I wanted to find myself. I mean, you know, it was the 70s, 1972, you could do it then. No, I thought, I'm going to go and find myself. So I decided I'd go to India, where I thought I might be. <laughs> and, 
I didn't get to India, I got to London, <laughs> where there are many Indian restaurants. And, <laughs> and I hung out there for a bit. And, but I knew when I wanted a degree, I, I, a job, I'd just pop out and get one. It was kind of that simple. Uh, a degree was a passport to employment, and now it's a visa. You know, it, it doesn't guarantee you a job, uh, it, um, it gives you an advantage in the job market, but it's, there's no guarantee attached to it. Now, I say this because if you wanted a single example of how the dominant narrative of education has broken down, it would be the declining value of a degree. The whole story on which public education has been built is if you go through the whole system and do everything right and get the qualification that you're aiming for, uh, then you know, you'll live your life in a quiet pasture thereafter, uh, reaping the benefits of your, all your hard work as a student. And it's not true now. Incidentally, in a way, it was never quite true. Never quite true. Uh, one of the other myths of public education, by the way, there are some seats at the front if anybody wants to come down. Tidy up to you. Shall I embarrass all of you and just stop? Did you? Yeah, are you all right? right. Um, no, one of the other myths of, of public education is that life is linear. In fact, education is based on really three principles, uh, all of which are untrue. Uh, apart from that, it's great. Uh, <laughs> one of them is that life is linear. Life is not linear. You know, the assumption is if you work hard and do well and go through the whole system, you will end up uh, in some prominent position in virtue of the work you've done. How many of you here, can I ask you, are doing what you expected to do when you were 15? Not many, it's not very impressive, is it, really? Um, what happens is, we, when we come to write our resume, we convince ourselves uh, that life has followed a narrative course. And actually, we were talking last night, various of us, uh, to people whose life has been completely uh, obtuse. I say that because life is, on the whole, obtuse. Um, it's because life is not linear, it's creative. Can I ask you, how many of you here consider yourselves to be highly creative? Let me put it a different way. On a scale of 1 to 10, uh, how would, let me count this down. On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you put yourself in terms of creativity? With 10 at the top, OK? Um, while you're thinking about that, have a think about this. How intelligent are you on a scale of 1 to 10? with 10 at the top. Um, now, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up, if you would. You don't have to. You can say, I'm sorry, I didn't come here this morning for this. You know, I'm a, <laughs> it's the President's lecture. I didn't come for a workout. But, <laughs> but if you're prepared to, uh, put your hand up if you'd give yourselves 10 for creativity. Thank you. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, two, one, come on. <laughs> Where was the top of that curve? What did you say? I think, yeah, okay. How about intelligence? Now, I know a certain social modesty kicks in at this point, but <laughs> try and overcome it. Who'd give themselves 10 for intelligence? Thank you very much. Brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. As intelligent as it's possible to be. Thank you very much. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Actually, you can go now if you like. Ready? <laughs> We're just wasting your time, honestly. This is. How about nine? Eight? Seven? Six? Five, four, three, two. I never do one, by the way. <laughs> well, if you've got one, you're not following this anyway, are you, to be honest? I mean, you... <laughs> Absolutely no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Where was the top of that curve? Seven. At seven, thank you. Um, one last question. Would you put your hands up if you gave yourself different marks? Now, this is what interests me. Um, often people do give themselves different marks for intelligence and creativity. Uh, the reason I'm asking you, by the way, I think you're all wrong on these scores, uh, apart from the tens, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
never argue with a 10, that's been my experience, but... <laughs> You know, just bound to lose. So, um, but the reason I ask you is that firstly, people do give themselves different marks for creativity and intelligence. But secondly, um, and, and by the way, it's because we tend to think creativity and intelligence are two different things. That you can be very creative, not very intelligent, very intelligent, not very creative. I often hear people say that to me. You know, they're, they're often doing very creative work, but they'll often say they're not very smart. Um, often very smart people say they're not very creative. And I find this very interesting because um, one of the reasons is that we have misconceptions about creativity and we have misconceptions about intelligence at the same time. Um, and I want to come back to that, but my point here is that, uh, that all of you have been successful in education one way or another. And yet you still give yourselves relatively low marks on both creativity and, in some respects, intelligence. And I find this very interesting because all children are born with tremendous confidence in their own creative powers, aren't they? I mean, as you, when you were a kid, I'm sure you felt tremendously buoyant about your creative capacities. Most adults think they're not. Um, so when I say education is based on various misconceptions, there are these at least. One of them is it's based on the idea that life is linear, uh, when life is not linear. Uh, I, mean, I had no idea when I was at school that I would be doing what I do now. Absolutely none. Uh, I was good at French and Latin at school. Um, I love French. Actually, I love the French teacher. <laughs> I did. Mr. Evans. It's a, <laughs> it's a long story. But, uh, and the law was different. You know, but, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but Mr. Evans uh, really impressed me because, firstly, he could speak French, and not all French teachers can. Um, secondly, uh, he had a French wife. Uh, we couldn't imagine it. Actually, we could. <laughs> Which is why I stayed with French for so long. Uh, but I loved French, I loved him, uh, and I loved Latin. And my careers teacher said, why don't you, have you when we came for my uh, annual kind of um, advisory meeting, he said, have you thought of becoming an accountant? <laughs> I said, curiously not, no. And, and his second uh, suggestion was dentistry. Uh, uh, and he didn't mention the French or the Latin at all, by the way. Uh, I did neither of these things. Um, in fact, I ended up working a lot in education for all kinds of interesting reasons to me. But I never had a plan. You know, when I went to college, I didn't know what I'd do after that. Um, I did a PhD because I was interested in doing it just for the sake of it. Um, what, happens, what happened in my life, and it will happen in your life if you're still at college, and it's happening to the people who have left college years ago. I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong is that for the most part, your life is, is a process of improvisation, isn't it? It's a conversation between your dispositions, your talents, and your circumstances. Uh, you compose your life, literally. Uh, you create it from nothing uh, and make something into it. And you can, of course, recreate your life as a result. But the result of that is that every single one of us has a unique life in history. Nobody else has ever lived your life before and nobody ever will. And you didn't plan it either. I mean, you probably planned some steps of it. There are some things that came along, but a lot of things you end up doing came from left field. You weren't expecting that at all. Um, some things you wish you had done and you turn away from them. But when you come to write your resume, you set it all out with clear headings in bold. Uh, you use italics here and there. You put key dates in. And, and you leave out the bits that you're embarrassed about. Uh, the things that don't add up make, sort of make the story seem plausible. And the whole idea really is that you don't want to present your life to a respective employer or, or institution of education uh, in terms of the actual chaos you've been living through. Uh, you want to make it all look like a rational scheme. Um, but the fact is that you're more likely to create a life that you like if you understand your real natural talents and the depth of your own creativity. That's my point. And education, for the most part, because it's based on a linear assumption of supply and demand, prioritizes certain disciplines, particularly in high schools, which are thought to be useful for later life. So some of you, I'm quite sure, were turned away from things you'd like to have studied at school on the basis that nobody could see you ever getting a job in that. You know, don't do this, you know, you're not going to be a, a, you know. It happens particularly in the arts, by the way. People say, don't do music, you're not going to be a musician, don't be a writer, you never make a living from that, don't dance, you know, whoever made money from dance. Um, and it's all based on the premise that other people know better than you do what's best for you. And 
it becomes institutionalized in public education. When we moved to America, we were told lots of things. One of the things we were told was that um, Americans don't get irony. Uh, by the way, did I explain that I now live in America? <laughs> we now live in America. And, um, actually, we moved to America 11 years ago. Actually, we moved to Los Angeles, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Thinking we were moving to America, but it was a... Uh, it's a short plane ride to America from Los Angeles, it's not very funny. <laughs> but we love it, and we were told things like, um, uh, Americans don't get irony. Have you come across this, by the way? Uh, it, it's one of those, it's a cultural myth. It's like the British are reserved. <laughs> you all think that, we're not reserved, I don't know why you think that, really. We've invaded every country we've encountered. <laughs> haven't we? We have. We've tried to dominate every culture we've come across. Why you think we're holding back, I have no idea, but... <laughs> you should be more forward. Really? <laughs> you have a problem. Actually, we got here on the, 4th of, uh, on the 30th of June, 2001, uh, which is four days before Independence Day. We had no idea. I mean, get over it, really. <laughs> People marching up and down, waving banners, blowing trumpets, celebrating the fact the British have left. <laughs> Do you know how that makes us feel? <laughs> when we've just arrived. We've, we've, <laughs> we've had to endure 12 of these now. We've, we've, we've got the hang of it, actually. We spend Independence Day indoors. <laughs> we do. We light the fire, close the shutters, and look at old photographs of the Queen. And <laughs> get us through. <laughs> but we, we were told, we had this little book given to us called um, How to Behave in America, A Cultural Guide. It's a contradiction in terms, isn't it, really? But anyway, the, it's, not, it's not, it's not, it's not. But we were, we, but one of the things it said was, you know, Americans don't get irony. Well, that's not true, is it? We were also told, by the way, that Americans don't like to be hugged. Is that true? No. We were told it was true. So we were turning up to all those receptions in Los Angeles when we first got here, my wife and I and our two kids, and we were, we were arriving, and I was saying to, the, uh, to James and Kate, don't hug anybody. <laughs> they hate that. You know. <laughs> don't touch them. Because you know. <laughs> it was in the book. So all four of us were standing there at these receptions you know, with our arms clamped to our sides like this. <laughs> not moving, and you could see people thinking we're like refugees from Riverdance, you know, that's... <laughs> and, and... <laughs> you could see people thinking, oh, that's that British Reserve thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we found out Americans like to be hugged, and now we hug people at random in the street, so... <laughs> and they don't like it. But, I knew that Americans got irony when I came across that legislation, no child left behind. <laughs> because <laughs> whoever thought of that title gets irony, <laughs> don't they? Because it's leaving millions of children behind. I can see that's not a very attractive name for legislation. Millions of children left behind, I can see. <laughs> What's the plan, Mr. Secretary? Well, we propose to leave millions of children behind and Here's how we're going to do it. And it's fantastic. It works beautifully. Uh, it's not its intention, by the way, but it works because it's based on the principles that are opposite to the way human life operates. One is that life is linear. Uh, the consequence of that is that in schools across the country, pro uh, disciplines that are thought not to be valuable for later life and work are being cut away. Um, the country, I mean, it's not just you, by the way, and I live here. My daughter's just become a citizen. We're permanent residents, so I haven't just come here to take a cheap shot. Um, we love it here. But uh, there's an obsession with a certain type of uh, utilitarianism in education. An obsession, for example, that's expressed in the preoccupation with the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, math. By the way, they're really important. I am not standing here to argue against the importance of either technology or math or of science um, or of engineering. On the contrary, I work with the National Institutes. They're brilliantly important. Some of the most beautifully creative people I come across quite seriously, I know, are mathematicians. Um, 
I once asked a professor of pure mathematics, how do you assess a PhD in pure math? I had no idea. You know, I wasn't very good at math at school. I said, how long are they? He said, he said he'd marked one that was 26 pages uh, recently of math, pure math. You know, um, I mean, hard math, obviously. You know, we're talking remainders and stuff like that. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know stuff you know not to be doing with. But page after page after page of math, you know, 26 pages of math with equals at the end, you know, I should think. Um, so I said, well, how do you judge one? How do you judge a PhD in pure math? Uh, I mean, presumably it's right. You'd be annoyed, wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> Spent five years doing a PhD in pure math, it comes back wrong. <laughs> what? <laughs> See me, you know. <laughs> Eight out of ten. He said, no, they're normally right. I said, how do you judge one? He said, there are two criteria. He said, the first is originality. It has to break new ground. You know, it has to be an original contribution to its field. In other words, it's how creative it is. I'll come back to that. But the second I loved, he said, there's another criteria. And I said, what's that? He said, it's aesthetic. I said, why does that matter? He said, because mathematicians have a very strong view that maths is the purest way we have of describing the truths of nature. And since nature is inherently beautiful, the strong intuition is the more elegant the proof, the more likely it is to be true. In other words, beauty is an informal test of truth in mathematics, as it is in everything, by the way. Beauty in almost every field is a test of truth. It doesn't mean it is true, but it's one of the ways we assess whether or not it may be. It's true in dance, in poetry, in engineering, in architecture, in design. Human beings are constantly making aesthetic judgments about each other, about the clothes they wear, the food they're going to eat, and we ignore this capacity and the need for it entirely in most forms of public education, as if it didn't matter, or indeed that it didn't exist. So I'm not here to argue against the STEM disciplines. On the contrary, we're in the building because of the success of the STEM disciplines. You know, I'm speaking through a microphone because these are very important disciplines. Our world is transformed by them, and I'll come back to it. But they're not the whole of education. They are necessary, but not sufficient for the type of education our children need and that you need. Uh, the result of No Child Left Behind and this false utilitarianism is that the arts and humanities are being scythed out of the public system. There are schools across the country, in California where I live, kids can go through the whole of their experience of K through 12 education, never, be, never dance, never be in a performance, uh, they never paint, uh, never act, not be encouraged to write poetry or even to read it. It's perfectly possible now. I know, by the way, I was talking last night with the head of dance here at uh, UVU, that dance is very well established here, isn't it, in the schools in Utah. That's fantastic. I think you're the only state in the union that could probably say that. And it's a, it's a precious heritage that you have to hang on to and treasure and promote. Um, the thing is, these disciplines are not antipathetic. One of the core principles edu of creative education is that they feed each other in ways that are often surprising. But that's the first thing, that life is linear. It is not. Uh, you create your life. And the life you create depends on how much you discover about your own talents and abilities, your own passions and unique dispositions. Many people go through the whole of their education not understanding a fraction of what they're capable of. And the one of the results is that many people go through their entire lives doing work they don't really enjoy. They endure it rather than enjoy it. By the way, I published a book a couple of years ago called The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. And that's about people who have the opposite experience, who love what they do, and who couldn't imagine doing anything else. And I'm sure there are a lot of you in the room just now. You know, if I said to you, why don't you try something else, you'd think, well, why would I do that? This isn't what I do. This is who I am. This defines me. I, and you know when you're in your element, by the way, because time changes. Your energy shifts. You feel elevated spiritually by what you're doing. I don't mean that in a religious sense, but in the sense of kind of that the, the, the pulse of your own life is quickened uh, when you do things you love to do. The second principle on which public education is based is, uh, the, op is the opposite of how life really is, which is conformity. Um, when I said each of you has a unique life, that's absolutely true. How many human beings do you think have ever lived? Would you say? Let me give you a clue. I'm talking about modern human beings like us. I mean, not, not people who went round on their knuckles. <laughs> you know, groovy people I'm talking about, you know, with attractive profiles and, and a sense of irony, you know, like us. <laughs> Incidentally, can I just say, I have traveled the length and breadth of America in the past 11 years. There is no evidence whatever that I have found that Americans don't get irony. 
any more than the British Reserve. It's a complete cultural myth. But I tell you, because I think you should know what people are saying about you behind your back. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Modern human beings are thought to have evolved about 50 to 100,000 years ago. So how many of us do you think there have been on the planet in the last 100,000 years? 15 billion, thank you. 30, do I hear 40? <laughs> Any more? What? 74 billion. It's very specific, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, let me tell you. Nobody knows, okay? <laughs> of course not, how would they know? We've not been counting for the past 100 million years. But there are serious attempts to figure this out. And if you Google the question, which is what I did, <laughs> it will take you to places like the uh, Center for Population Studies, <laughs> where you will find uh, that the figure is close to the last one that was shouted out, somewhere between 80 and 100, and 100 or so billion. So let's take the lower figure. Let's say 80 billion, maybe, human beings have lived. The thing is that of that 80 billion, almost 10% is on the planet right now. We are the largest generation in the history of humanity. For most of history, there were fewer than a billion people. Indeed, until the beginning of the uh, Enlightenment in Europe and the Industrial Revolution, there were fewer than a billion people on the planet. And we're now past seven billion and heading to nine billion by the middle of the century and maybe 10 by the end of it. That's a proposition we've never had to face before. Um, there was a very interesting program on the BBC last year called uh, it was about how many people can live on Earth. It was called, How Many People Can Live on Earth? <laughs> <coughs> BBC is very good at titles. <laughs> they looked at available supplies of food, water, fuel, land for agriculture and so on. And they did the calculations. You can download this. Uh, it's online. They came to this conclusion that if everybody on Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion people. So we're halfway there. The trouble is, we don't all consume at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda. They said if everybody on Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in North America, that's us, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.2 billion. And we're five times past that already. Uh, so if everybody on Earth wanted to live as we do, and all the in indications are that they do, uh, we would need four more planets to make this work, which we don't have, you'll have noticed. <laughs> so the need to address that issue uh, through education is becoming even more pressing. But the other point I want to make about the 80 billion people on the Earth is that of all the 80 billion on Earth, nobody's ever lived your life, and nobody ever will. Uh, every single human life has been completely different and unique in terms of talent, sensibilities, and possibilities. How many of you have got children of your own? Or grandchildren? Okay. <clears throat> and the rest of you have seen such children, small, <laughs> small people, wandering around. <clears throat> let me make you a bet. How many of you have got two children or more? All right, let me make you a bet. If you've got two or more children, I bet you they are completely different from each other, aren't they? You would never confuse them, would you? Like, which one are you? Remind me. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to colour code you. I'm just getting completely confused. And they're different because you're different, and we're all different. I'm a lot like my father, um, uh, but I'm not a clone, you know, because I'm also a lot like my mother. Uh, but I'm not a clone because I didn't exist before. And, uh, and like all of you, your children have deep resources that we may never know about and may never tap into. You may have all kinds of talents you've never yet discovered. But my point is that our education systems are predicated in K through 12 on conformity. Whereas the real dynamic of human life is diversity. What happens is in our school systems, because they become more standardized, is we bleach out the differences and we end up with a very narrow conception of, intel of intelligence and ability. One of the reasons I think people give themselves low marks for intelligence is because we have a very limited conception of what intelligence is. We confuse intelligence in general with academic ability in particular. Academic ability is very important. It's what universities have thrived on for a very long time. But it's very specific. 
It's a capacity for deductive reasoning of a certain sort, or more properly for propositional knowledge. The kind of ideas you can write down and in some forms of mathematics. Um, the thing is, human intelligence is much richer and more diverse than all of that. If it were not, human culture wouldn't be so interesting and so varied. Uh, but very many people, if their talents happen to lie in, in dance, let's say, or in visual arts, or in theatre, or in practical things, they find themselves often marginalised by the dominant culture of public education. We have, in, we have skewed towards a very narrow conception of ability, and to, to justify it, we've invented a very broad conception of inability and of disability. Um, when I was a kid, I, I was, my uh, father was convinced <coughs> that I was going to be a soccer player. And uh, we live right next door to the big soccer ground in Liverpool. There are two, actually. Uh, what we think of as a good one and a bad one. Uh, we were near the good one, Everton. And until I was four, my dad was convinced I was going to be a soccer player. Uh, I was you know, very fit, strong, um, tremendously attractive. <laughs> a few things have changed, of course. But, um, and then, uh, in the 50s, some of you will remember this, there was a polio epidemic that swept across America and Europe. And I got it. Don't know why either it was, but I did. So I was in hospital for uh, a year, almost. Um, completely paralysed, and then I came out of it on two braces and crutches and with a wheelchair. Um, but I, I should say, by the way, I had long curly blonde hair and a lisp. I was like a money machine. <laughs> People came up the street spontaneously to give me money. And uh, I didn't ask for it, but my brother kept it. <laughs> he now has a small island in the Caribbean. <laughs> but, but it kind of put an end to my soccer career. You know, my chance of getting into my local team were pretty much uh, limited at that point. Not now, by the way, given how they're performing. I think I'd probably... <laughs> I think I've had a fairly good chance of making the first 11, but... But I went into special education. Uh, when I came out of hospital, I was in it for five years. Um, and then uh, I passed this exam and went into the public system. But I, I say because... In my classroom, uh, there were kids with cerebral palsy. There's one guy who only wrote with his foot, um, who could hardly speak because of it. People confuse cerebral palsy with some kind of mental disability. And it may be nothing of the sort. It's just an inability to control your own musculature. Um, and you know, when you think how many muscles you use to speak, if, if you can't control that, you end up sounding incoherent. Um, we understood him perfectly well because you, you, know, you got your ear in. But there were people with asthma, the guy, my best friend, had hydrocephalus, his head was enormously inflated. Um, uh, I was saying to somebody recently, actually, our classroom was like the barroom scene from Star Wars, you know, it was like... <laughs> people, 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 people used to arrive at school in instalments very often, so... <laughs> assembled in the classroom. But, but what the thing was, we didn't no notice any of that. We didn't pay attention to it. What we were interested in was whether people were interesting, smart, funny, or whatever. And they were. The trouble is, when you have a narrow view of ability, and you invent a large conception of disability to account for it, people then become hypnotized by the disability. So they look upon people as somebody with cerebral palsy, rather than like, who is, who's in there? You know, they don't look past the disability. They start to remediate it. Now, I say it because, in my experience, over a very long time these days, everybody, you included, has special needs of some sort. There's something that you know about yourself that you worry about, some things you try to compensate for, something that kind of perplexes you, uh, some things you feel you have to battle against, some things you wish you didn't have to deal with. Everybody has it, and it, and it happens in, as a natural course of being a, a person. But, and for some people, it may seem obvious what their disability is. It may actually not be that at all. Actually, they may be perfectly at home with what you think is their problem. There may be something else that's on their mind entirely. But it happens all the time, and it's why one of the consequences of public education is that so many people drop out of it. Um, and I, I promise to come back to several things. That's another one I want to come back to. But conformity is at the heart of our public system, and it's an offence to the nature of human growth and development. You know if you're you know, in your own family that your job as a parent is to cherish the differences in your children, not just to emphasise how similar they are. And our education system, for historical reasons, has become preoccupied with what people have in common or should, 
and has marginalised the differences. And that, again, is expressed in the way in which we um, screen out certain disciplines, certain ways of thinking in schools. Um, so education is about conformity and um, not diversity. It's about linearity. Um, it's not about creativity. Um, and it's also uh, about compliance. It's about sticking with the programme. Uh, and it's not about uh, individual discretion. In fact, though, the great achievements of human culture have come from people who didn't stay with the programme. Uh, now, by the way, I'm not trying to say for a minute that, um, that in order to succeed in your life, you must first fail in education. On the contrary, very many people do brilliantly well in the current system, but far too many don't. Politicians now talk about getting back to basics, and they're right, but they mistake the basics for a group of disciplines. And my point, really, I just want to rehearse it briefly with you, is that the, the basics of education are not disciplines, they're purposes. And there are at least these purposes of education, which our current systems don't serve well, certainly in K through 12, but the implications for higher education, I think, are immense. The first, and these aren't in order of priority, but the first basic of education is economic. Uh, and I mean that very directly. We, we invest so much in education, particularly now in higher education, on the assumption that this investment is an investment and it will be repaid in economic growth and development. But we also believe it to be true in our own lives at a very personal level. We believe that if we do well, or if our kids do well in education, they will go on and get a good job and become economically independent. Isn't that right? And we all want that. I mean, I do. I can't tell you how much I want my children to be economically independent <laughs> and as soon as possible. But the old system, the one that we're living through, was developed to meet the economic imperatives of a different age in human development. Um, the old system grew out of industrialism, which was a linear, a linear narrative. And the reasons why the system is shaped is, is why very few people used to go to college, because very few people with degrees were needed to be the professionals in the industrial economy. Most people would be doing um, blue collar work, which is why we had a mass system of elementary education. There was a report published, uh, when was it, uh, last year by IBM. They surveyed around 2,000 CEOs around the world and asked them what their top priorities were in running their companies and organizations. And they said they had two. The second priority was to run organizations that are adaptable. They said, how do you run organizations which will adapt quickly to change? And they complained that many of the people coming out of universities were not quick to adapt. Their workforce was not quick to adapt. And by the way, the peril is real. I mean, look at what happened recently to Kodak. Kodak um, has now gone into chapter 11. Kodak, you may remember, was the largest photographic company in the world. They invented the digital camera. And they just went broke. Uh, they did not go broke because people have lost interest in taking photographs. Actually, this generation takes more photographs than any previous generation in history. But Instagram uh, was developed by a group of young people, you know, kind of in the fabled garage, and was bought was for a billion dollars, I think, recently by Facebook. Why didn't Kodak think of Instagram? And the reason is they were too big and lumbering and awkward to do it, and they were too obsessed with the old way of doing things. And there are lots of examples. Polaroid went the same way. So how do you adapt to change? That's the first priority. The second, and actually the top priority for most companies, is creativity. It said, how do you run organizations that are inherently creative? So from an economic point of view, creativity is a fundamental bottom line issue. And we don't cultivate it in our education systems. The second big priority for education is cultural. We live in the world that's becoming more and more complicated culturally. And in fact, many of the challenges we faced are cultural in character. I mean, look what's happening just now in the Middle East. Um, by the way, I came across this thing, I thought you might like it, about what it is to be British these days. You could read American, but it's the same sort of thing. Um, incidentally, I, I published a book uh, last year, you've got it, haven't you? The, the, the President, President Holland kindly mentioned it, Out of Our Minds, Learn to Be Creative. Uh, for those of you who haven't read this book, by the way, I just want to tell you that it's terrific. <laughs> You'd be foolish not to buy this book, really, and as soon as possible. I published it 10 years ago, but I rewrote the entire book uh, in the last 18 months. And the reason was the publisher said, we're going to bring out a 10th anniversary edition of the book. Would you like to make any changes to it? And it's, well, I, it seemed to me improbable, really, you know, that it could be improved. <laughs> you know, it was, after all, a masterwork you know, that I'd 
composed myself. But I said I'd take a look at it. What I had in mind was a weekend with a spell check, you know, and a bottle of Burgundy. And um, in fact, I end up rewriting the entire book. And one reason that so much has happened in 10 years. I mean, 10 years ago, there was, there was no Facebook. Uh, there was no, no smartphones, no iPads. Uh, there was no Twitter. 10 years ago, people didn't tweet, did they? I mean, if they did, they were discouraged, and they? People, <laughs> people, people, people would say, why are you doing that? Would you, would you mind doing that outside? We're trying, we're trying to eat in here. I rewrote the book, by the way, on Microsoft Word. I'll just tell you, do any of you use Microsoft Word? Well, look, you, you know, it's, it's a good program, but it has its shortcomings. Uh, one of them is it has opinions. <laughs> Have you noticed? If you're writing on Microsoft Word, it, it, it gives you little squiggles. And uh, I, they're very squiggles. Some of them are just pointing out you've made a spelling mistake. That's fine. Or, you're, or you've... Um, put a punctuation mark in the wrong place. They're fine. They're helpful. The ones I don't like are where it just disapproves of what you said. <laughs> there are certain things that just irritate Bill Gates, and one of them... <laughs> one of them is the passive voice. Microsoft Word can't be doing with the passive voice. If you say anything in the passive voice, you immediately get a green squiggle. And it suggests you rewrite it in the active voice, and it suggests what it would be. Uh, what would have happened to all the great works of literature if they'd been written in Microsoft Word. <laughs> like Walt Whitman, Mark Twain, you know, Virginia Woolf, all in Microsoft Word. It'd all been this jaunty vernacular, wouldn't it, really? <laughs> like, well, like emails. Anyway, I wrote this sentence. The foundations of the modern intelligence test were laid in the late 19th century by Sir Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin. That's true, by the way. It's a good sentence, isn't it? I'll read it again for you. The foundations of the modern intelligence test were laid in the late 19th century by Sir Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin. Microsoft Word didn't like that. It has the passive voice in it, were laid. So it helpfully suggested this alternative using the active voice. This is absolutely true. In the late 19th century, Sir Francis Galton laid a cousin of Charles Darwin. <laughs> the foundation of the modern intelligence test. <laughs> I had no idea. Anyway. anyway, I came across this thing about being British. It said, being British these days means driving home in a German car, stopping to collect some Irish Guinness or Danish lager, picking up an Indian curry or a Greek kebab, and spending the evening sitting on Swedish furniture, watching American programs on a Japanese TV. <laughs> and the most British thing of all, Suspicion of anything foreign, <laughs> which is more or less right. So the cultural imperative is uh, at the heart of education. For that, by the way, we need a broad education, which not just encourages the arts and sciences, but also the humanities and, and physical education and the rest. But the third imperative of education is personal. In the end, education is inevitably, irrevocably, always personal. Because you're a person, you're not a, a component. And education has to engage people personally. People can't learn unless they choose to and want to, not properly, not unless their minds are, and their consciousness is actively uh, engaged and encouraged. In America, the evidence currently is this is not working. One in three kids drops out of high school between the ninth and the twelfth grade. I was in Houston, Texas recently, where it's 60 percent. Um, in a lot of our communities around the country, it's an average of 40 to 50 percent. At the same time as kids are dropping out of school, which is catastrophic in this sense, many states are reducing spending on education and spending more, increasing spending, on the prison system. One in 31 Americans is currently in the correctional system, more than any other country in the world per head of population. Uh, I don't mean to say if you drop out of school you'll end up in jail, that's not true. What is true is that a very high proportion of people in the correctional system did not complete their education because they didn't, therefore, I think, see other routes and possibilities available to them, and some, of course, just fell foul of the system. So it's economic, it's cultural, and it's personal. But what I just want to get to is this, before we wrap this up, is that 
we're facing a revolution. To meet it, we have to think differently, therefore, about our own abilities. When I asked you right at the beginning about intelligence and creativity, and I said you, I think, uh, have underestimated them. Let me just quickly say why. Creativity is one of three key terms I think we should be putting at the heart of our education. The first is imagination, the second is creativity, and the third is innovation. Imagination, I believe, is what sets us apart from the rest of life on Earth. I don't mean that we are wholly different from the rest of life on Earth. We're simply not. Actually, we're much more like the rest of life on Earth than we, we often dare to entertain. But in one respect, we are clearly different. Uh, and it is that we have an extraordinary set of capacities, which we call imagination, which are, are, are the capacities to bring into mind things that aren't present to our senses. With imagination, you can revisit the past. In fact, you, you have a past. Uh, and it's not a single past. The whole process of historical studies is a contest to understand the past. There isn't a single meaning that we can just record. It's about looking at layers of possible meanings in the past. But with imagination, you can visit the past. You can anticipate the future. When it comes to human affairs, it's very hard to predict the future. Um, and it's obvious in every kind of way. Um, it, when Bill Gates, uh, when uh, Steve Jobs and Johnny Ives were developing the iPhone, they built in the capacity to have apps, uh, as you know, and there are now millions of them. Um, they didn't anticipate the sorts of apps they were going to get because they couldn't. One of the apps for the iPhone turns it into a blues harmonica. Do you know that? If you download it, you can turn it, you, and you turn the iPhone on its side, and it, you, you play the side of the harmonica. It becomes um, a blues harmonica. So you can play the Delta Blues, if you wish, on your iPhone. I can't imagine that was part of the design brief, can you? <laughs> uh, Apple, we're going to produce this smartphone, but it's really important that you can play the blues on it, because <laughs> otherwise who's going to buy a phone, you know, like that, really? The last thing people now do on their iPhones, by the way, is actually make telephone calls. Um, so it's hard to predict what human beings will do with technology and with each other's contributions and creative capacities. So, but, so you, but you can anticipate the future. But also with imagination, you can engage with other people's points of view. You can empathize. You can see the world as they see it. Um, empathy, really, the seat of empathy is imagination. It's, it's not a coincidence that in times of conflict, the first thing that leaders try to do is to suppress our empathy for the people that we oppose, to not see it as they see it. And it's only when you suppress empathy that you can do things to each other that are unimaginable. Imagination is really the, the bond that holds our communities together, our sense of fellowness with other people, our sense of fellowship. Creativity is a step on. Creativity is putting your imagination to work. You can be imaginative all day long and never do a thing. To be creative, you have to do something. And it can be anything. These are the myths about creativity. One, that only special people are creative. It's not true. Every single one of you has profound creative capacities. Whether you develop them is another matter. It's like literacy. Everyone's born with the capacity for literacy, but not everybody is literate. Creativity involves acquiring sets of competencies and skills, as does literacy. People can speak, but they can't write. You may have an imagination, but you may not know the depth of your creative possibilities. You have to practice that stuff. The second myth is that creativity is about special things. So people think it's all about the arts. So it, what I want you to think about, really, is when you gave yourself a mark for creativity, what was in your mind? Very often people will say they're not creative. What they mean is, I don't play an instrument, or I don't draw, you know, or I don't dance, or I don't, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a poet. I am a lifelong advocate of the importance of the arts and education. But creativity is a bigger concept. And there are other reasons to support the arts than creativity. They're to do with the language of feeling, they're to do with our cultural literacy, our sense of empathy with other people. Creativity is a part of that, but creativity is at the heart of science, it's at the heart of technology, it's at the heart of business. You can be creative in anything. Creativity is applying your imagination to something. I can define it more specifically as the process of having original ideas that have value. And it's a process that can be applied in every field and can be taught. And the third misconception is that it can't be taught. You're either creative or you're not, and that's it. And the truth is there's a lot you can do to make people more creative. And my contention is just this that given the challenges we face in our own lives, given the need for our own self-fulfillment, given the economic, cultural and personal agendas that confront education, our way forward has to be to refresh our conception of human intelligence and ability and 
the strength and depth of individual passions, aptitudes. And for that, we need a form of education which looks hard at old methods of pedagogy and revises them, uh, which develops more interactive process of pedagogy, which has a more generous conception of the curriculum, and which looks hard at the culture of the organisation in a way that recognises that higher education is not simply a staging post between high school and secure employment. The fact is that all of us are having to remake the future now, and we'll do that best, we'll be able to transform the world around us best if we have a deeper and richer sense of the world that lies within us. I think this is a real challenge for teachers and for leaders in education. The last point I just want to make about this is that education is often described using mechanical metaphors. Um, you know, we talk about inputs and outputs and products and all of those things and linearity and supply and demand. Human communities are not at all like mechanisms, they're like organisms. Because human life is organic, it's not mechanical. And running an organisation is much more like farming than it is like engineering. What I mean is that people thrive in certain conditions and circumstances because we're human. Not far from where I live is a place called Death Valley. Um, Death Valley is the hottest place in America and nothing grows there. Nothing grows there because it doesn't rain. In the winter of 2004, it rained. Seven inches of rain fell on Death Valley. And if you go online, you can see these images. If you just Google Death Valley, two, spring 2005, it rained in 2004. In the spring of 2005, there was a phenomenon. The whole floor of Death Valley was carpeted in flowers. People came from all across the, the world to see this phenomenon that they didn't expect, that Death Valley had temporarily become a pasture. Uh, what it proved, of course, is that Death Valley isn't dead. It's dormant. Right beneath the surface, these seeds of possibility waiting for the right conditions to come along. And if the conditions are right, life is inevitable. In, with organic systems. Of course, then it stopped raining and all that stuff fell beneath the ground and there it is till next time. But it's exactly the same thing with human communities. Human communities flourish under certain circumstances and they shrivel under other circumstances. I've seen it in schools and colleges all over the place. You can see a school in a difficult area that is an absolute oasis of imagination, creativity, and possibility, because they have a great leader who understands how it works and great teachers who are empowering the children and are learning as much as the children are learning. I've seen great schools go down in no time at all because they've become arid wastelands of standardized testing, uh, where the impulse to learn has been stifled and in the end thwarted. The job of a great educator, whether you're a classroom teacher or a college president or a school principal or dare I venture to say, the Secretary of State, is not command and control. If you want pure efficiency, you may just want to control everything from the centre. If you want innovation, change, adaptability, flexibility and human flourishing, your job is not command and control, it's climate control. It's giving people the opportunity to grow and knowing what those conditions are. And by the way, the role of a creative leader is not to have all the good ideas, it's to create a culture where everybody has great ideas and feels empowered to offer them. And I think if we were to do that across our education systems, the future would look very different. Um, there was a wonderful quote by a woman called Anais Nin. Do you know her? She was a poet. She talked about her own creative journey. And she said, there came a point in her life, she used this interesting organic metaphor, it's very brief, it's called risk. She said, there came a point in her own life where the risk of remaining tight in a bud was greater than the risk it took to blossom. And I see that happening all the time in education. The effort we put in to suppressing and restraining the creative energies of our students is much greater than the effort it would take to release them. And if we were to release them, I think we'd have a harvest of innovation whose benefits would feel in the long term, and I think it would help to create a future for all of us that we'd all want to live in. Thank you.